Well, first of all, uh, I have to admit that I'm no expert on Syria. And what I'm saying in these very first hours, basically, of, of the first 24 hours of the fall of Damascus is um, um, based on what I can read in Arabic with my very limited uh, school Arabic, but also in classes that might not be available in the British press and media. Um, the fall of uh, Assad was probably obvious by Friday of this week. Um, however, um, I think even by the standards of the Middle East, things moved very fast in the last hours yesterday. Uh, one of the reasons one could have predicted that uh, Assad was going to fall was that the Iranian government moved most of its embassy staff, its consulate staff, out of Damascus Friday. I think the Russians did so earlier. So it was quite clear that Russia and Iran were not going to support Assad in, its, in his last hour. We also have today Netanyahu's triumphant speech in the last few hours. This wouldn't have happened if we hadn't weakened Hezbollah and Iran. And that is definitely a fact. It's, I don't think anyone that uh, the rebels wouldn't have considered uh, extending their forces beyond Idlib, which was a region they controlled, um, unless uh, Iran and Hezbollah had been weakened. And obviously, it is also true that Israel has weakened Hezbollah and Iran. Um, however, all this hasn't stopped Israel bombing a um, very significant number of bombings today in Syria. The latest ones that I have seen, the security complex in Damascus is getting bombed. Apparently, according to IDF, these are there are dangerous weapons in some of these places that might fall into the hands of jihadis. Well, um, there is stories and stories. So was Assad less of an enemy than the jihadis if you are just bombing them now? Or is it because you now know Iran and Russia will not retaliate your bombing. I think um, here we also have to remember that uh, we don't know how much Iran was weakened by the Israeli military attack that happened in October, but um, we have a speech by the British Armed Forces Chief who was speaking last week to Rusi who claims that um, Israeli bombing of Iran has turned back the country's ballistic missile capability by at least a year. And that is significant, if that is true, uh, given its um, weaker position, Iran might have decided that it wasn't worth spending its military power against the um, um, the rebels uh, in defending Assad, it was wiser to keep whatever it has for its own defenses. However, I think all this has to be seen in the light of some of us, what some of us were seeing in the middle of last week. And that was a changing position in Tehran. I don't follow Russia's politics, so I don't know when Russia changed that policy. My understanding is that Russia decided yesterday in the final discussions between Assad and uh, sections of the opposition that uh, there was no compromise to be had and therefore um, advised Assad to leave, basically. But Iran's position changed earlier in the early part of last week. And by midweek, we were seeing some very strange uh, articles in the Iranian press, especially those sections of the Iranian press that are pro-Supreme Leader uh, sections that are close to some parts of Iran revolutionary guard. The newspaper Hamihan reported the advances by the rebels in a very positive light, very unusual for Iran. Iran has constantly referred to these rebels as um, 
jihadist, Salafist, enemies of the Syrian people. So that was a change in tone. This change in tone was picked up by the rest of Iranian press and media, but this can't be an accidental change in their views uh, because obviously they wouldn't have dared um, uh, publish articles against Assad if the official line hadn't changed. And definitely the official line had changed. Um, the editorials in papers close to the um, uh, uh, Supreme Leader had changed. And um, we also had pictures of uh, the rebels with um, a slogan, on the road to Damascus. Very strange. Uh, there was speculation. Some people called it Iran's uh, enigma regarding Sham. Sham is the Arabic word for Syria. So the enigma was what is happening. Um, as I said, we now know uh, the embassy was um, emptied on Friday. I think we hear there is speculation, obviously, about the military capability of Iran, whether it didn't want to um, use it for Assad. But there is also speculation on political reasons why Iran uh, isolated Assad in his last hours, in the hours where he needed support. And a number of those issues have been uh, widely discussed on Arabic and Persian websites today. Um, apparently, there were 22 meetings, believe it or not, between the signing of a peace deal regarding Idlib between Russia, Turkey, and the rebels on the one hand, Russia representing Assad. And in these 20 meet, 22 meetings, attempts were made to find some kind of compromise, some kind of, if you like, what people call long-term solutions. And in most of these, some reports suggest, and here I can only rely on what is being reported. I have no internal knowledge. I didn't even know 22 meetings had taken place. But many comment on the intransigent of Assad regarding um, uh, Idlib, uh, which apparently annoyed some of his allies, including Russia at least, but maybe also Iran. But there is also um, comments about Assad's refusal to um, side fully with the axis of resistance. And here, what is referred to is Iran's request to use the Golan Heights at the time when Hezbollah was being attacked in order to help Hezbollah, and Assad refused that. Um, again, it could, this could be, and in the Middle East, you always have to think that this could be um, uh, uh, false information put out by the Islamic Republic because in the last minute it decided not to support Assad, and now it's looking for excuses on why it didn't support Assad. But it was seen as Assad as a continuation of Assad's refusal uh, to, if you like, be an active and real part of the axis of resistance. When people talk of the axis of resistance, I must admit, they very rarely mention Syria. What is mentioned is mainly Houthis, Hezbollah, and Iran, and Syria at the end. But no one has really seen major operations by Syria, except that revolutionary Iranian Revolutionary Guard commanders have been targeted in Syria. And in that way, I think Israel has dealt a severe blow uh, to Iran rather than to Syria. Um, news got even worse when Arachi, who a week earlier had said he would support Iran would do uh, whatever is necessary to support Assad, was interviewed and said and refused to um, uh, comment that he could predict survival of Assad. This was Thursday of the week that passed, in, con in complete contrast to what he said a week before on Friday. Um, so that is part of the scenario. Uh, it doesn't explain many of the reasons why Iran and Russia didn't support Assad. Uh, last week, I was interviewed by a news uh, agency about Russia versus Iran in support for 
Syria and the news agent, the reporter was asking me, well, isn't it true that Russia has been much more active supporting Syria than it has been supporting Iran? I think that is true uh, to a certain extent. For Russia, the jihadists are not just uh, an existentialist um, force in the Middle East. Quite a lot of these jihadists are Chechens or uh, Turkish speaking uh, uh, jihadists from the republics in the southern borders of Russia. And given uh, Netanyahu's, um, uh, sorry, Putin's obsession about uh, Chechnya, it's inevitable that that also played a part. Um, a few comments about HDSA, this group that has, was a jihadi group, was part of Al-Qaeda. Um, I think I, you don't need a lot of historical explanations. All you have to do is look at Jolani's pictures. He's photographed in 2014, looking very much like Bin Laden, wearing clothes of Bin Laden. In the last week, we have seen him being interviewed by women reporters. He wouldn't have seen uh, a woman, um, wouldn't have been in the same room as a woman who was just veiled by, the, by a small headscarf. But also he now looks like Zelensky. In fact, many people have commented on how uh, he has, um, his appearance does remind us of Zelensky. Contradictory messages to the countries of the region, to Iran, uh, late last week, he said, Jolani addressing Iran said, uh, you should reconsider your support for Assad. We have nothing against you. Uh, we can be as friendly to you as Assad is or was. However, another um, commander from the same group uh, told uh, Israeli TV and an Israeli uh, official uh, reporter, we are your friends. Uh, our only enemies are Iran, Hezbollah, and it was Assad, and now he's gone. So you shouldn't believe, I think, anything that Jolani says or anything that his political group says. But the turmoil is, has just begun. I can't imagine that this group um, will remain in power. There are many contenders for power in Syria. There would be many infighting between those contenders. Yes, very few of them had the power of uh, this group. They didn't have a region like Idlib under their control. Uh, but um, whether Jolani can um, control uh, some of the excesses of his own armed forces is under question. He keeps telling them, be nice to children. In Aleppo, I am told that once the troops entered Aleppo, Halab in Arabic, uh, they offered um, uh, food to the residents, they were friendly to the Christians and so on. Uh, but remember, this is the organization that also beheaded opponents. It's also a very brutal, crude jihadi force. Whether the new Zelensky looking Jaulani can control his jihadi forces is very much in doubt. But most importantly, you can't possibly imagine that um, the uh, maybe secular forces who opposed Assad in 2011, but also the myriad of other opposition groups that did oppose Assad and have been quiet of the, over the last few years because of repression by the uh, 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 Ba'ath regime, will be quiet and will say nothing from now on. Uh, there is um, speculation about Israeli advances in the Golan Heights. We should expect that. There is also speculation that Israel might advance quite further into Syria under the excuse of protection, self-defense, whatever they have used on other subjects. One of the saddest part of the whole scene is now the Syrian Lebanese border. In the last two weeks, it was the scene of Lebanese uh, from South Lebanon returning from Syria to go back to Lebanon and go back to the demolished area that Israel has left after carpet bombing of South Lebanon. We now have 
Syrians who are returning to Syria from Lebanon, who were refugees, Lebanon had a very large number of, I think a couple of million Syrians who were refugees. One of the largest population of refugees in Lebanon was Syrians. They are returning, but there are also the Syrians who are leaving Syria and the border, the chaos on the border is, in my view, a, a, a glance at the chaotic and unbelievably harsh situation that the peoples of the region are facing in what, at the end of the day, remains the responsibility of the kind of scorched earth area that the United States and its ally Israel have created in the region.